Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Boy, uh, in the BFD stories of the day, I think at the top of the list has to be this New York Times report. Justice Department issues 40 subpoenas in a week, expanding its January 6th inquiry, sees the phones of top Trump advisors, which uh, the Times says is a sign of an escalating investigation two months before the midterm elections. And clearly, they are also going after all of the fundraising activities. And as the Times reports, the fact the Justice Department is now seeking information related to fundraising comes as the House committee examining the January 6th attack has raised questions about money Mr. Trump solicited under the premise of fighting election fraud. So for those of us uh, who were somewhat skeptical about how aggressive Merrick Garland might be in going after uh, Donald Trump and his circle, I think we're getting the answer. Uh, so I want to discuss all of this with today's guest, David Korn, D.C. Bureau Chief of Mother Jones, an analyst for MSNBC and author of the new book, which is out today, American Psychosis, an historical investigation of how the Republican Party went crazy. I'm sorry to laugh there, David, but, you know, the American psychosis hit, it, you know, this feels very timely. And I, I don't know how you feel about this, but it feels like it becomes more timely all the time. And when, when you set out to write this, did you think it was simply an historical account as opposed to putting our crazified America on the couch? You know, I started this book, you know, somewhat over a year ago. And when I began, I did it obviously because the subject interested me. This is a history of the Republican Party's interactions with far-right fanaticism and how the GOP for seven decades has encouraged and exploited extremism, tribalism, bigotry, paranoia, conspiracy theories, and so forth. Uh, but I, didn't, I did not think that when it came out, it would be as timely as it is. You know, we seem to have finally caught on, we collectively, the political media world, to this very important conversation, which is the hold that MAGA extremism has on the Republican Party and whether Donald Trump has led the party in the direction of fascism. I mean, that's what we've been talking about the last few weeks publicly. I think some of us have been concerned and have worried about this for, for years now, but it seems to have come to a head particularly with Joe Biden's recent speech and all the outrage about calling a party that wants to overturn elections and now supports a leader who wants to pardon violent insurrectionist semi-fascist. And of course, it's self-serving of me to say this on this particular day, but to understand the moment we're in now, and more importantly, to figure out where we go from here, I think having a real good understanding of the history, what has brought us to this point, is crucial because you know this, but you know, I think we all lose sight of this. It didn't start with Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is not, in essence, the problem. The problem is that millions of Americans who are susceptible and eager to buy the swill he sells, and this is an issue. The, the Republican Party and its and the base of the party's relationship with extremism and tribalism and paranoia and conspiracy theory has gone on for seven decades. It's been, in some ways, I think, building in the last 20 or 30 years, and it's brought us to this moment. And that sort of, and if you understand that, I think it informs how you think about where we should go from now. There are a lot of people out there, and um, you know, maybe you're in this category. I don't know, Charlie, you can tell me. That, that say, if we could just go back to the way the Republican oh, Party no. used, used to be. Yeah. You know, just, you know, you know my, my father's Republican Party. And, and the point of my book is that that is a bit of a myth. And that, yes, th there was a time when, when you had presidents who cared about policy to a certain degree and who were not demagogic in the same way that Donald Trump is. But the point of my book is that this strain that has been let free to run under Donald Trump has always, always been there. The party's always had a relationship with it. This is the, sort of the dark side, the dark history of the Republican Party. And so I think going backwards is not a solution. I think we need to figure out what to do now that this virus within the party has become a pandemic um, and, and threatens not just the party, but the republic overall. And so understanding you know, what's ha happened over the last seven decades and seeing how it's been, how it's developed and, 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 and it's been cultured and cultivated by the Republican Party is key to figuring out 
how the rest of us should handle the problem we face today. Well, let's start with the title of, of, of your book. We, we can get to the extremism and we can get to the fascism in a moment, which, of course, we, we will. But the title of your book is American Psychosis. And, and, and then I found to be kind of you, you sort of stop there because there is that feeling that we are a nation that has taken crazy pills. So t- talk to me about psychosis, because you use the word psychosis and crazy. Well, and well, by the way, I mean, I, I obviously agree. I mean, you know, I wrote the book, you know, how the right lost its mind. But you go for even further. So so. Why psychosis? Well, psychosis is when you're detached from reality. You can't tell truth from lie, nonfiction from fiction. That's what psychosis is. And it's not necessarily just being extreme and saying you're an extreme libertarian and you don't believe, or an extreme art anarchist and you don't believe there should be government, which they happen both to believe in, right? Uh, it's not necessarily political extremism. It's the inability to engage with objective reality or even to recognize it. And if you look at, you know, the big lies is one of the biggest examples we have here, that you have tens of millions of Americans who do not accept the reality of Joe Biden's victory, and they believe that somehow it was stolen. Some believe the cockamamie conspiracy theories about the Chinese, the Venezuelans, bamboo ballots, these deep states, CIA, you know, 2,000 mules, and none of that is true. And the thing is, there's been no evidence. I mean, it's not even something we argue about, like what does it mean that A, B, C happened, and maybe it means this. No, there is no confirmed so, evidence of any of this. So that's what I mean, psychosis. And you could throw in, you could throw in the QAnon conspiracies, yes. you know, the baby face-eating conspiracies, pizza gay. Birtherism so, and everything birth, else. But, But how much of this is, and this is why I want to focus on your title, uh, American Psychosis, because this is, of course, the the haunting fear is is that America really has, you know, gone crazy that, you know, or or that the right has completely lost its mind. So how much of this is ideological and how much of this is psychological? I mean, you follow where I'm getting at here? It's one thing to believe ideological lies or to believe, you know, that, you know, for example, there's a communist plot to take over the country. That's largely ideological. But at some point, it also becomes psychological. And, you know, R- Richard Hofstetter described this as the politics of paranoia. So where does it morph one morph into the other? And that's, you know, I harken back to Richard Hofstetter's mm-hmm. 1964 seminal essay, The Paranoid Style of Politics, because he saw this with McCarthyism. And I'm not sure there's a clear line because there, there is a, you know, there can be a concern, an ideological concern about leftism. You know, you don't like socialism. You fear that it moves towards communism and the takeover of private industry and whatever. You can have an ideological aversion to, uh, to those notions. But once you come to believe that the, P, that, that the commies have infiltrated the PTA, that Dwight Eisenhower is a communist mm-hmm. agent, that George C. Marshall, the Secretary of Defense, is leading a communist plot, which is what Joe McCarthy charged back in 1951, John and the Burgers. Republican Party you know, rallied around him with this. You know, Once you start to believe those sort of things, then it moves from, uh, from ideological to psychological. You're being driven by fear by irrationality, by fear, by grievance, by resentment. And one word you left out there in this, you know, maybe triumvirate, you said, you know, ideological, Mm -hmm. psychological, there's also cultural. I think a lot of this is cultural and that people are identifying in a tribal way and they're looking at whether you want to call elites or the others, people who they don't believe are true Americans that could have a racist component to it. And they're looking for reasons for conspiracy theories, but stories that tie together their feeling of enmity towards these other people. So they're looking and they're believing QAnon because if you don't like Hillary Clinton, well, obviously she's running a baby eating sex trafficking ring out of the basement of Comet Pizza, even if it doesn't have a basement. I mean, so there's a there's sort of a political cultural civil war going on in this nation. And I think it overlaps with some of these psychological elements that drive people to become detached from reality and believe things that are just not true and have no basis in reality. So I probably should disclose at this point that I read your book in Galley and 
have blurbed your book. And what I wrote is, in this searing and deeply reported work, uh, David Korn recounts how the modern GOP succumbed to the extremism, alternative realities, and paranoia that spread the American psychosis that exploded on January 6th, a desperately important read. But as you can imagine, for someone with my background, it's also a very, very challenging read. You know, I wrote a book called you know, How the Right Lost Its Mind, which was a revisionist history of conservatism. Your book I read as a revision of my revision, and I found it very, very challenging because you take some of the the, the stories and the the narratives that, that I had taken for granted and kind of turned it on its head. So let, let's go back and forth on this, because I do agree with you when you say that there's no going back to the Republican Party. But my take has been, and, and I want to, again, have a discussion about this. My take has been, of course, there's always been these elements, the crazies, the mouth breathers, the, the extremists, the, the paranoics, uh, the, the crackpots. But that for much of the history of the Republican Party, they were the recessive gene. They were always there, but they were the recessive gene. You have a very different take. Your, your history is how they were always important and how the Republican Party failed again and again. So let's start with Joe McCarthy, okay? 70 years ago, you know, nation's number one red baiter. And, and you talk about all the highlights, all the times the GOP bowed or depended on or promoted these far-right extremists. Dwight Eisenhower surrendered to Joe McCarthy on a train. 1951, McCarthy accused Harry Truman of scheming to deliver the nation to disaster. Eisenhower knew McCarthy was a dangerous demagogue and a fabricator, and he was upset by the attack on Marshall. But ultimately, Eisenhower didn't take a stand against Joe, Joe McCarthy. Is and, and, and that 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 seems like a seminal moment when the Republican Party could have stood up against the fabricator and the, and the demagogue and chose not to. So how important was that moment? You know, I don't want to give too much weight to any particular moment. But history sometimes does pivot at a particular point, right? And often it's a point that you don't recognize yeah. that it's happening at that at that moment in time. And it's interesting. I, you know, I, I did Morning Joe this mm-hmm. uh, this morning, and and Joe himself, another recovering Republican, um, picked up on this particular anecdote, which leads off one of the chapters in the book. And I, I so here is a chance when a war hero. Dwight Eisenhower, a man whose courage could not be challenged and who saw Joe McCarthy for what he was, a scoundrel and a liar, and who had a personal beef with Joe McCarthy because Joe McCarthy had accused George C. Marshall, then the Secretary of Defense, who had been Army Chief of Staff during World War II, Eisenhower's comrade in arms, a dear friend of his. He had accused, McCarthy had accused Marshall of leading mm-hmm. this in this small cabal that had taken over the U.S. government that was plotting actively to hand the country over to the Soviets. This was the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense. So Eisenhower took this personally. He saw McCarthy for who and what he was and recognized the danger. And he wanted to give a speech while they were campaigning together in Wisconsin before the 1952 presidential election. McCarthy, senator from Wisconsin, was up for re-election, and Eisenhower was running Mm -hmm. for his first term. And he had a junior staff writer write a paragraph, which would not call McCarthy out by name, but everyone would know it was an attack on McCarthy in a defense of George C. Marshall. And members of the Republican elite, the governor of New Hampshire, the governor of Wisconsin, the head of the RNC, who are on the train, saw a draft of the speech and said, you can't do that. You're going to kill us in Wisconsin. We're going to lose votes. Um, You know, we're going to lose Catholic votes because McCarthy had started drawing Catholic voters who were primarily Democrats into the Republican Party with his red baiting. And Eisenhower on the train said to his chief of staff, OK, take it out mm-hmm. and gave a speech that night that was actually the Milwaukee Journal called it light McCarthyism. So I don't know what would have happened if he had looked at McCarthy on that stage who was on, you know, he they were campaigning together and said those words, what might have happened to the Republican Party. But to your larger point, you know, I, you know, whether it's a regressive gene or a dominant gene, it's a gene that's always been there. And I think yeah. it's always been important to the party electorally, you know, to give it a winning margin. In a lot of close elections, the Republicans would not have won 
if they hadn't kept the kooks, as Ronald Reagan once called them, on their side. You know, right. John Boehner with the Tea Party, Ronald Reagan with the moral majority, you know, at the time that he embraced them, leaders of the moral majority were saying that gay people wanted to kill Americans. That's what Jerry Falwell said. And some of them were even saying that homosexuality was a capital crime. And according to God, homosexuals, lesbians, gay people could be put to death. And, you know, there was a lot to Ronald Reagan other than, you know, extremism, but he embraced these people and they gave him a winning margin in 1980 against Jimmy Carter. So whether it's regressive or not, it's always been there. And the party leaders have always reached out, found a way to embrace it, and certainly have not tried to put it down. Well, let's flip it around, though, because obviously there's no question that this is this is true. There is the tolerance for all of this. I think there was the sense that, OK, they were they were nut jobs, but we need that coalition and therefore we're going to tolerate it and perhaps even even support it occasionally. But going back to your anecdote about Joe McCarthy, and obviously this hits home because this is my home state. And, you know, you quote my old newspaper uh, where I got my start, the Milwaukee Journal at the time, uh, you know, called Eisenhower out for surrendering ethical and moral principles in a frenzied quest for votes. But as you pointed out, you know, Eisenhower goes on to win the election easily and he regretted cutting his remarks and he continued to loathe McCarthy. And so Joe McCarthy was a force in the Republican Party, but so was Margaret Chase Smith. So was Dwight Eisenhower. And ultimately, the Republican Party turned against Joe McCarthy. And, you know, a majority of, I mean, and, and Republican senators went along with the vote to censure him. So, yeah, you know, Republicans have had the Joe McCarthy's, but they've also had the Margaret Chase Smith's. This was also the party of, you know, Ed, Everett Dirksen. Uh, you know, Barry Goldwater did obviously flirt with the far right, uh, but ultimately he also then, you know, broke with Richard Nixon over ethical issues. He broke with the Christian right over its fundamentalism. This is a party that, yes, had these crazies out there and, you know, would make, you know, wink, wink, wink. But this is still a party that nominated, not that long ago, Mitt Romney for president. It nominated John McCain for president. And Paul Ryan was the vice presidential nominee a decade ago. So clearly there's always been a tension in the party between the nuts and the people who were trying to hold them back or making peace with them. So talk to me about that push and pull between a party that can nominate Mitt Romney one year, and then go full sort of QAnon a decade later. Right. That's a really good point. I, I do think there has been a tension, but I do think it has waxed and waned mm-hmm. at different points in time. While McCarthy held the party, you know, under kind of a, a tight control in the early 50s, half the Republicans in the Senate, not all of them, half of them voted to uh, censure him when he, you know, when his excesses got too excessive. Right. But uh, the other half of the party continued to stoke McCarthyism without McCarthy. Right. And, and, and so, you know, and in 60 in 64, Barry Goldwater made an alliance with the John Birch Society, which was McCarthyism on steroids and wouldn't denounce them. So he, he could use them in his campaign. And, and it was because of them that he beat Nelson Rockefeller, this moderate liberal Republican in the 1964 contest for the presidential nomination of the Republican Party. So, you know, it's even with, you know, you can look at like the, you know, the Republican voters voting for Mitt Romney because, you know, in what was sort of a Tea Party year, because there was no Tea Party candidate, Michelle Bachman, Herman Cain, you know, uh, uh, Rick Perry, who was able to act the least bit competent, right? But Mitt Romney still ended up embracing literally hugging Donald Trump when Trump was the number one birther in the country. Yeah, no, right? so, I, so, I remember this. Yeah, I know. And, and so, yeah, so Mitt doesn't Classic fall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mitt doesn't fall into the category of this, but he's still playing footsie with these people. And as, as you know, John Boehner, you know, the, the, the epitome of a country club Republican who wants to cut deals. He wanted to cut a, a grand budget deal with Barack Obama on the deficit and social spending. And, you know, regardless of whether, you know, whether the deal was good, bad or indifferent, he wanted to do something. And he couldn't because the only reason he had power as speaker was because he had embraced 
the Tea Party people who were complete loons and believed that Barack Obama was a secret socialist Muslim who wanted to destroy the country and you couldn't cut a deal with him or you shouldn't cut a deal with him. And if you did, we're going to bounce you out of leadership. So, it, it, you know, it's always been there. There have been times when, 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 when Republicans have disavowed it in 1962. Uh, William Nixon, F. Buckley. When, no, yeah. no, I'm talking about Nixon. No, when, oh, okay. when Richard Nixon was running for governor of California in 62, he denounced the John Birch Society. And then, but then in 68, and he lost, I'm not saying he lost because mm-hmm. of that, but then in 68, when he ran for president, having supported civil rights the way that a lot of moderate Republicans had supported civil rights, you know, as the party of Lincoln, in 68, he got the nomination at the convention in part because he cut a deal with the white supremacists, segregationists like Strom Thurmond, and promised them no more pro negro crap that was his words to john uh, uh to um john mitchell his um chief of staff at the time so he was the guy who at one point was the moderate republican you know in favor of civil rights uh for black americans and now he's only he's saving himself politically by getting bed with strom thurmond these are a series of bargains yeah this is what i think is is so interesting because yeah. we've talked about the faustian bargain with trump but but this was a there was a series of bargains going back to all of that i mean you know with richard nixon and the southern strategy which has had such dramatic effect on the republican party but i want to go back to the birch uh, issue the john sure. birch society because we had a piece in the bulwark i think it was uh, i don't i don't want to get it wrong but you know what basically says you know the john birchers have won you know they are now you know kind of dominant in uh, on on the on the right which is remarkable for many of us because you know famously william f buckley jr um excommunicated them for a while from the conservative movement in the 1960s and it certainly seemed for many decades as if the John Birch Society had been confined to the fringes. They were still there, mm-hmm. but but nobody took them seriously. So again, we have this push and pull, you know, William F. Buckley Jr. using his tremendous clout to be able to say, we can't have the anti-Semites, we can't have the Birchers, we can't have the Klan. We need to have these bulwarks against, uh, against the crazy, you know, but after a series of these deals that you've been describing, and then also just the collapse of the guardrails. I mean, there's no one like a Buckley now who has right. the ability to say no to the crazies, right? I mean, you know, the, all of the incentives are to make common cause with the crazies, to to either ignore them or or actively, actively support them. But But no one is standing up and saying the future of the Republican Party means we need to get rid of the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Alex Joneses. We cannot tolerate people like Lauren Boebert. No one is saying it, but then no one really can say it any longer. You know, on on the Buckley point, I would just uh, commend uh, listeners to read my section on that because it was true in 65, he kind of wrote the Birchers out of the conservative movement. But in 61 and 62, and up until that point, he tried to walk a fine line in which he was critical of the leader of the John Birch Society, but didn't want to throw the Birchers out. And he was doing that in part in conjunction, one could call it a conspiracy, I guess, with with Barry Goldwater, who wanted the Birchers on his side as his ground troops in his 64 press. So it's a, it's, he got to that point eventually, but how he got there, I think is a fascinating uh, story that, that, that it's been lost a bit, but I, but you're, you're right. I mean, when Reagan ran for governor in 66, he wrote a letter to a colleague and said, we have to keep the kooks at bay, mm-hmm. his words. And he was talking about Birchers, extremists, and others. But once, you know, there are a lot of different turning points in history, right? But I think, you know, Newt Ginrich and Rush Limbaugh started bringing back this idea yeah, of the paranoid style of politics and that the Democrats were not just wrong, they were the enemy and they were not just, you know, doing bad things, they were involved in conspiracies. You know, the Clintons killed Vince Foster, Rush Limbaugh, was out there again and again saying that climate change was a conspiracy by liberals and Democrats so they could take money away from you. And it was all hatched and it was a hoax. And Ginridge and others were promoting this way of thinking about politics in the 90s. And you can, you know, move it on up, you know, to Sarah Palin. 
And, you know, listen, you know, I knew John McCain and I liked John in a lot of ways. I had some great moments on the campaign trail with him. And I think he, you know, was was a decent man who tried real hard often to do the right thing. You know, like a politician, mm-hmm. in my view, often didn't, but often tried to do the right thing. Campaign finance reform is one good example. But picking Sarah Palin yeah. was you know, unleashing <laughs> the furies, you know, the, the crazy element within the party that was always there, the Birchers, whatever you want to call them, now had a place on the ticket. Newt Gingrich spoke to them in the 90s, the anti-government militias and the NRA, which had a bulletin board with bomb-making recipes and people encouraging the stockpiling of weapons for the Civil War to come against the Democrats and liberals. I mean, he encouraged all that stuff. Palin just put it right there on the ticket when you'd go to these rallies, which I did, and people, she'd basically called Barack Obama a terrorist, and people would say, communists, kill him, kill him. And I think that what we've seen over the last 20, 30 years is that the party, I don't know if it's a chicken and egg type of thing, right? That as the base has gotten more desirous of red meat, the party has offered more red meat and has become more accepting of that. So John Boehner bringing in the Tea Party. I mean, this all tees it up perfectly for Donald Trump, who says, you want red meat. I'm not going to pretend anymore. I'm not going to pretend to be a legislator and a statesman and also cut my side deals as, 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 as maybe Mitt Romney and others did in the past. I'm just going to go straight with you with a bucket of bloody slop. And we're going to see, you know, and there was kind of an experiment in the 2016 primary. We're going to see how this works. And it turns out that there was an audience that had been somewhat conditioned, Conditioned. embraced, accepted. And, you know, that their grievances, their paranoia, their resentments, their fears would be fed by Republicans and by people like Glenn Beck um, on Fox, who had been supported by Republicans. Remember, Glenn Beck is saying Obama wants to put you in concentration camps. That is if you survive the death panels. I mean, he was literally saying that. And John Boehner, Sarah Palin and others, Republicans were going on his show and validating him. And so if you're telling the Republican Party that this is the state of reality, well, then when you come along and you're Jeb Bush and you say, I want to work with Democrats to improve our education system, they look at you like, are you crazy? Don't you know what's really happening out there? No, they had released the, the Furies. And, and and it is interesting, you know, to point to the moment where John McCain, who clearly knew better, who was not part of that culture, made that deal that unleashed the Furies. And this is what I found so interesting going back, you know, through your book, is these decisions made by people who in private would say these people are fucking nuts. And yet they rationalize doing business with them. I really like their story which I had I'd completely forgotten about back in like George H.W. Bush, you know, perhaps the most decent, one of the most decent men ever in, in politics, at least that's my view. But in September 1992, you, you describe how uh, H.W. appeared before the Christian Coalition and lauded founder Pat Robertson for all the work you're doing to restore the spiritual foundation of the nation. This was literally one year after Robertson had alleged the Bush was part of a satanic plot literally. (laughs) Robertson claimed that Bush had unwittingly carried out the mission of a cabal whose goal was nothing less than a new order for the human race under the domination of Lucifer and its followers. And yet even H.W. feels the need, okay, I got to go in and I have to kiss, you know, crazy uncle, you know, Pat Robertson's ring here. And of course, the Christian coalition played a major role in putting Newt Gingrich in power in 1994 and then helped rescue George W., when McCain threatened to defeat him. And again, George W. being a perfect example of this, you know, in private, he would say what a bunch of loons these folks were, how frustrated he was with them. And yet they made one of the many, many, many Faustian bargains that, as you put it, unleashed the Furies. You know, it's, it is interesting because the, the, the George Bushes are very similar in terms of, of, of the history that we're talking about, right? The guys who are, you know, country clubbish, Republicans and and not crazy people, not extremists themselves, both and not even that ideological in many ways. And yet to win, they recognize they had to kowtow to crazy people. You know, Pat Robertson's not just crazy. He writes this book called The New World Order. Yes, it sells no. hundreds of thousands of copies. It's a bestseller. Complete and it revives yeah. 
every conspiracy theory almost that's ever been told, the Illuminati, the Masons, secret societies, occultists, working with communists, and the Trilateral Commission, and the Federal Reserve, and the Rothschild family. Don't forget the anti-Semitic part of this. And they're all working together to impose a world totalitarian dictatorship. For what? To help Lucifer and Satan. This is all Satan's doing. I mean, it's very, he's not, he, he's not very metaphoric here. He's literal. No, and then right. George H.W. Bush is helping them do this. And then you go to this convention of, you know, thousands of Christian coalition people and you praise Robertson, you're authenticating, you're validating, you're saying this is a fellow who needs to be listened to. And so the hundreds of thousands and millions of people who watch him on TV you know, are getting the message from the Republican Party leadership that you should listen and pay heed to Pat Robertson. And then when George W. Bush runs for president eight years later, and he actually, you know, I would be a compassionate conservative. He's trying to separate himself from the Ginridge mm-hmm. Republicans and some of the far right hardcore social conservatives of you know, that you might equate with the Christian coalition. But then as soon as he gets into trouble, when McCain wins New Hampshire after Bush won Iowa, and it looks like he might roll Bush, Bush runs to South Carolina. He goes to Bob Jones University, which at that point in time, in the year 2000, banned interracial dating, interracial marriage, and was still uh, preaching that Catholicism was connected to Satan. And he gives a speech, he endorses, he validates they, you know, this this racist institution. He, you know, brings in the Christian coalition, Pat Robertson and his forces that are very big in South Carolina, all to beat back John McCain. And then he doesn't apologize for going to Bob Jones University until like a month or two later after he's won the South Carolina primary and he's gotten what he needed out of these people. So it's highly cynical, but also I think what it does is it continues to reinforce their standing with their party and their view of reality. Yes, but, you know, you you mentioned this is cynical. They, of course, rationalize this because politicians always have the capacity to rationalize this as, you know, politics ain't beanbag, and this is what you need to do to win elections. And I think the assumption was at the time that you would uh, trot these people out around election time, you would uh, pat them on the head, uh, you would ride their votes, uh, hopefully to victory, And then once safely elected, you could put them back in the closet. You could shove them back in the closet. And by the way, that was the that was the assumption. Of course, the 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 crazies realized what was happening, which also is, you know, how the the furies were released, because they 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 understood that they were being used um, and then pushed to the side. But I think that the assumption on the part of most Republican leaders was that the center would always hold it. Yeah, you'd have the crazies that were out there, but in the end, it would be a Bush or it would be a McCain or it would be a Romney, that they would not they would be the recessive gene, right. that we'd be able to keep them in the back room. So what happened in 2016 and what's happened since, and it feels like it's accelerating, which is why that your title is so timely, The American Psychosis, is that all those theories, all the crazies that everybody had, I said the back room, what I meant was the basement, you know, sort of kept them in the basement. You know, they were, they were the people that would, you know, yeah. you, you, when, when, you know, polite visitors would come, you would make sure that door was, was locked. They're out and they're dominant. And so I guess the question is, and, and, and I think you, 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 you acknowledge this in the book as well. Donald Trump is not the cause for this. This was a pre-existing condition. So, I mean, Trump obviously is the, is the vehicle in the engine to, you know, unlock the the door to the basement. But how did this fringe now become so dominant? Even, I mean, even if, if Donald Trump disappears tomorrow, this is what the Republican Party has become, right? I mean, the public Republican right. Party has been completely crazified and there is no ability for these reasonable voices, you know, the Liz Cheney's of the world to stand up and say, by the way, this is crazy. This is, uh, this is unpatriotic. So how did that happen? I mean, there's yeah. so many different factors here, but but what was the switch for these folks that had always been around but never had been dominant, who who had been encouraged by these series of Faustian bargains? How did we get to this moment? When I was working on the book, I tripped over this quote, which I used for my epigram at the very start of the book. It's from Catherine Ann Porter, who was a well-known journalist and 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s, I guess, or even later, 
and, and, a, and a novelist. She wrote a book called mm-hmm. Ship of Fools that people might remember. And the line is this. We know that the Furies do not come uninvited. So it's, <laughs> you know, right? You know, you know, we're not here because of accidents, right? We, we, and, and the way I look, you know, you said, you, you're asking like what flipped the switch. Um, and I see this as a continuation mm-hmm. of things getting more and more intense, giving the crazies, as you call them, more and more leeway. And you know, once you start feeding them red meat, they want more and more red meat. And it's hard to go back to cheese and crackers. And I do think that, you know, there are a lot of, all, you know, obviously there's no simple answer, but the development of the internet and the information revolution, which allowed extreme voices to coalesce and find one another. It allowed, you know, it took away the ability of the mainstream media to keep some extreme voices to the side or, or, or somewhat suppressed or at least muffled a bit. I mean, it used to be that, you know, I'm thinking it's like, you know, if Jeb Bush had run 20 years earlier, the mainstream media would have basically just said he's the guy and and the other voices talking about Trump or other more extreme candidates would not get as much play. They couldn't, you know, get the traction that they could get under Trump uh, with the ability, with the particularly, I think, with the rise of conservative media that started creating its own yeah. reality. I mean, this starts with Fox in the late 90s. And I worked at Fox in the late 90s and early aughts. And I, you know, I saw it as an f- ideological operation. I was you know, one of the few liberal voices they had. But when I would go on Fox, I would argue policy and politics with John Kasich, Tony Snow, and I loved it. These guys were right. Maybe you know, to me, they mm-hmm. were far right, but they were you know, re- conservative Republicans. But we were talking about real things and not talking about and not arguing that the sky was whether the sky was purple or blue, but you know, Fox obviously has morphed more into this echo chamber that you know kowtows and caters to the more extreme elements. I, I think maybe Glenn Beck, you know, sort of who went beyond Rush Limbaugh and craziness, sort of steered it in that direction, and and the and the rise of the Tea Party. So there were a number of factors, Charlie. I, I think Rush Limbaugh has a lot to do with this, and the rise of conservative talk radio, where when, when being extreme and being, you know, I think impolite and not having civil discourse and, and vilifying and demonizing the enemy. I mean, there was, there was no mass media of the left that, de- that demonized and, and de-civilized discourse the way that Rush Limbaugh did. I mean, liberals like listening to NPR, where you get both sides and everyone's very polite. That's what they listen to when they drive. You know, Rush Limbaugh developing this audience of millions sent a sign to Republican candidates and to other people in the Republican or conservative media world. And I think he owns a large share of this. Now, ultimately, the the responsibility is the American people who who fall for this because if you know if he didn't develop an audience it well, wouldn't yeah. have gone anywhere right but he found an audience and he made that audience i think worse than it might otherwise have been well i agree with that but also looking back over the last uh, 10 15 20 years for many many years republican politicians had to at least you know acknowledge mainstream opinion uh they were held in somewhat check uh they felt the need to police themselves to uh, not go too far not sound completely crazy because they, they they needed to uh you know speak to a general population now they no longer have that kind of accountability right now i mean someone like a ron DeSantis, in order to understand him you have to understand that he knows that the mainstream the, the traditional media has no power over him, that he is speaking to a world that will never hold him accountable for false statements or extreme statements or any of that. So the entire incentive structure has changed so dramatically. I mean, I've watched politicians who had to sort of keep an eye 
on the fact checkers for a while. They they ha- they recognized that if they associated with uh, with extremists, uh, or radicals, or you know Holocaust deniers, that they would pay a tremendous price for it. And and then suddenly, you know, their their long held fantasy: what if there was no media watchdog? What if there was no eyes looking over your shoulder of you know saying that okay, you you've gone too far? And so now all they need to do is to pander to that particular base. And it's changed the entire culture of politics. So what I'm trying to get at is, you know, part of the growing insensitivity to, you know, how far you've, you've gone is a result of this. And I, I was reading a, a tweet from Philip Bump from the Washington Post yesterday. You know, the beauty of the internet is that it brings people together. The downside is that some of those people are idiots and bringing them together just convinces them that they aren't idiots. So what's been happening is, is that, You've had this sort of doom loop where the the extremists and the nut jobs surround themselves with other extremists and nut jobs, and after a while, they don't realize they're extremists and nut jobs. They just think they're they're brave or they're victims. Well, yeah, well, they they think they're protecting democracy when they sack the capital. Uh, and don't forget, there is a money side to this too, in that a lot of people have figured out how to make a buck off this through you know direct email solicitations and you know the the, the fundraising. You know, you you get all the fundraising notes that I'm sure I oh, do, yeah. and you know they are as dire as anything I've ever seen about you know how the the, the liberals and Democrats are far left radical communists who want to destroy America, and so you know that and that's sort of what every Republican is saying now. Uh, it, it obviously, they're obviously doing that because it works because this Absolutely. is what you know they're they're they. they they're getting the money returns. They can see this. And that is, you know, playing on people's fears, but also reinforcing those fears. And that's sort of the dangerous loop that I think the Republican Party has been in since the McCarthy period. You know, you know, are they you know, creating the fear or are they just playing to the fear? And I think it's it, it, both are happening. Yeah. And, you know, you start, you know, and I think Newt Gingrich came along and, and really started that in, in, the, in the 90s in, in a big way. Um, and it's just taken off since then. And it's a type of thing that it's very hard to figure out how to pull a 180 here. Once you've told people that the president of the United States is a secret socialist trying to destroy the America you love and people believe that, you know, you can't go back to arguing about housing policy. You know, right. you can't say, well, should the capital gains rate be 18 percent or 21 percent? Yeah. No, no. You just told me that, the, you know, that, the, that this guy wants to destroy Christianity. OK, so explain this one thing to me. Um, um, of all of these, these shifts, I see the roots of them. I know where they, they, they came from. Um, I obviously, you know, miscalculated on how influential they would be. But explain to me the fascination with Russia, because the one thing that I wouldn't have seen oh. coming is, is the is that America first it comes to now America last. Tucker Carlson's fascination with Vladimir Putin. How did the right learn to love a KGB thug? I think there are maybe two, two maybe other overlapping factors. You know, very quickly, because this is not the current book, but my last book, Russian Roulette, you know, looking at Donald Trump in Russia, yeah. I think Donald Trump just wants, you know, loves strong men and he is envious and, 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 and aspires of Putin and aspires to be Putin-like or Erdogan-like. Like and so he all and, and he wanted to do business there and it was in his interest to to talk up Putin because it was good for business. I think he had a very particular set of interests that drove him into right. the arms That's of Donald Trump. Trump. That's Donald Trump. Now yeah. for the conservative movement and republic, you know, Republicans at large, some Republicans not all. I think it's they look at Putin and they too want a strong man in what they consider to be this cultural, political, civil war. The night before Russia started its brutal, barbaric invasion of Russia, Steve Bannon was mm-hmm. on, was doing his podcast, and he was saying, "We love Putin. I mean, he doesn't fly rainbow flags. He's not woke. I mean, they like him because they see him as, you know, as as being somewhat of a." right-wing Christian nationalist who's against gay people and, you know, and wokeness. And they would like to see that applied here to the United States. And they also, I think, you know, in the, in the last 
two years. It's the enemy of the enemy. I think with Tucker Carlson, he he falls into the category I just mentioned. But also anybody who gives Biden a hard yeah, time. I, I think that's the key. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine he went on the air a few nights ago and said Russia was w- winning the it. war? I mean, it's I mean, I. I did a story a couple of psychosis. Months ago, yeah. You know, yeah, I did a story a couple months ago, you might recall, in which I got my hands on, you know, they were in Russian, I got them translated, memos that the Kremlin put out to media, Russian controlled state media, telling them in, you know, talking points about the you know, this is after the war started, about how to cover the war. And one of the talking points was to use more sound bites and clips of Tucker Carlson. Now, if if that were me, I would at least, you know, try to keep it keep my love affair with Putin oh. and my rooting for Russia a little bit on the down low here but but in Russia they recognize him as being uh, a propaganda plus for them uh, and so I think it's anti it's you know it's the enemy of the enemy so they're anti Biden but also they want a Putin like response here to cultural shifts that they oppose. You know, um, I, I wrote about uh, this in my newsletter this morning. Will the U.S. abandon Ukraine? It could happen, obviously, um, in, intentionally provocative. And and my argument is that, you know, Putin has gotten a lot wrong. He's made a lot of miscalculations. But I think that uh, at some point he undoubtedly has to be thinking, if I can just stretch this out, if I can outlast the Biden administration, Trump 2.0 would be a completely different world. Uh, you know, if Donald Trump goes back into the, the, the White House, America's support for Ukraine could could essentially flip, uh, given Trump's obviously you know personal fascination with Vladimir Putin, but also now the much of the right and the right this this MAGA right this isolationist right is the id of the Republican Party right now. I mean, Reagan yeah. foreign policy has been completely uh, abandoned. Um, you know, people who who you know think well, well Tucker Carlson doesn't matter. He matters if Vladimir Putin is sitting in the Kremlin and he thinks that this is the authentic voice of the American conservative movement, which may be the ruling party in a couple of years. It gives aid and comfort to Vladimir Putin, who thinks that if he can pick off the Republican Party and the Republican Party can get back in the Oval Office, then 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 he will have succeeded in. Well, he will have succeeded and perhaps succeeded in breaking NATO. So, I mean, the stakes are, are massive here. And, and, and Tucker Carlson clearly is an indication that he's telling Russians, look, this is what American conservatives are thinking. This is what MAGA world is thinking. This is what a Donald Trump restored to the presidency would do um, about us and about Ukraine. You know, I hadn't thought of it that way, Charlie. I think that's a very, very smart, sharp point that I will steal from you and write about myself. Please do. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, but I, I, I think, you know, it is, if, you know, that it, I could see that being part of Putin's calculation because certainly, that you know, he's getting his butt kicked this week. But, you know, a, a military of that strong should have the ability to at least slog it through and, you know, even as a stalemate and, and, and maintain that. And, and as, you know, Again, I have to reference my, my last book, which I co-wrote with Michael Isakoff, Russian Roulette. You say, what would happen if you know if Donald Trump got back into office for Vladimir Putin? Well, Donald Trump got into office the first time <laughs> in part because of the help from Vladimir Putin. I mean, Putin worked actively. It was one of, wasn't the only factor, but it was one of several factors that helped Trump get elected. So one could see him doing that again, right? That, that that could happen that way. So I do think there obviously then is this danger. I mean, what, what happens if they come in? I mean, and I'll say this too, you know, people who have heard me talk about Trump before may have heard this particular line, but I've long said that there are three things that motivate Donald Trump. Revenge, revenge, and revenge. Mm-hmm. And maybe spite, but that's the cousin of revenge. And if he should get back in office, and even if they're House Republicans who do his bidding, take over the House in, in a couple of months, revenge is going to be on the top of the to-do list. And if you look at people who he doesn't like, one is this guy named President Zelensky who, you know, who helped to get impeached the first time, mm-hmm. right? He has no love lost for Zelensky and Ukraine. And he still believes, he promotes this crazy conspiracy theory that Ukraine was really behind the hacking of the DNC in 2016, not Russia, and that they hid the servers so that that could not be proven, and thus 
Trump's victory was tainted by, you know, the false allegation that Russia intervened when it was, not, of course, not a false allegation. So he really doesn't like Zelensky and Ukraine. So if he comes into office, he is not going to be of a mind to do anything to help them, right? In fact, he will be out there actively looking to use his power to hurt them. I just don't think that can be overstated. I agree with you, no. The book is American Psychosis. It is out today, an historical investigation of how the Republican Party went crazy. David Korn is the D.C. Bureau Chief of Mother Jones, also writes the newsletter Our Land. David, thank you for coming on the podcast today. It was great. Always great to talk to you, Charlie. Thank you very much. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow. We'll do this all over again.